Some cars burn a lot of oil between oil changes. We talk about that and viewer questions on sports sedans next on Talking Cars. Hi there, and welcome to Talking Cars with Consumer Reports. I'm Tom Mutchler. I'm Jake Fisher. And I'm Mark Rexon. Mark, we welcome you to Talking Cars. It's a pleasure to be here. We brought you here for a non-controversial, easy, softball topic. Oil consumption. Well, it's something that actually aggravates a lot of people, as we've discovered. And we did some survey research of about a half million people, and our responses were pretty interesting. Right. I mean, that's important. Before we go into the details, I mean, half a million people. You know, we've been getting questions on talking cars for, for months, probably years actually, about, oh, I've heard Subarus burn oil. I've heard this car burns oil. We didn't want to just jump on the bandwagon of, you know, hearing internet reports. We wanted to do the full analysis, the full gamut, which we can do because we have this massive reliability survey. Right. So what we did was, well, the first thing is pretty much every car as it gets toward about 100,000 miles, it's going to burn a little oil, the tolerances aren't as good, and you know the car's starting to show signs of wear inside. So we decided to take that out of the equation. We wanted to focus on cars that were probably still underneath uh, their existing powertrain warranty. So we only took cars from model years 2010 and closer. What we found in surveying owners of about 500,000 vehicles is most cars, a vast majority, in fact, 98% of cars don't burn oil. But 2% isn't something that you just write off, because if you take 2% and put it into all cars sold since 2010, you're still talking a million and a half vehicles that burn oil. And we found some really interesting trends from that. Right. Now, Jake, the thing is, we focused on newer cars because we believe you shouldn't have to add oil between, between oil changes, should you? Right. This is not something that people really expect. Um, lo and behold, we actually started getting into it and a lot of manufacturers hide behind kind of the small print in their, in their manuals, which is basically saying that if it's using a quart of oil every thousand miles, they're like, that's normal. I ask everyone, I mean, is that really normal? Is that something people expect? I don't think so. I think most people just shut the hood of their car. They want to weld it shut and much, just basically, yeah. you know, when they're done with it, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like electronics. But um, so they are hiding behind that. Um, but you know, a lot of the vehicles are using a lot of oil, and it's different. You know, there's a big difference in our findings. Mark, are there some brands or some engines that stand out more than others for burning oil? Yes, there are. In the case of our survey results, we showed that both Audi and BMW, certain engines from those manufacturers do worse than others. Uh, in terms of which vehicles they're in, we're looking at the Audi A3, A4, A5, A6, and Q5. Yeah, that's the two liter turbo. That's the two liter turbo. Uh, and then BMW's five, six, and seven series that have one of two different V8 engines. Yeah, the four eight V8 and then the four four twin turbo V8. Right. Yep. And then to a lesser extent, the Subaru, uh, Impreza, Outback, Legacy, and Forester, uh, which have uh, two different four cylinders as well as the Boxer six. Right. Well, what's interesting about that, you say lesser extent and what there is, I mean, the reason we went and did this, because we want to actually find out real numbers on these cars and find, because there's a lot of things going on on the internet. You know, you go to the forums, like, I had this problem too, they're all falling apart. There's a lot of um, interest in terms of Subaru. Mm -hmm. And what this is a game of the denominator. So they build a lot more Subarus than they do maybe some of these, you know, V8, uh, BMWs and whatnot. So there's actually a lot of people who um, have written to us about Subarus and saying, well, oh, why is only Subaru having this problem? Well, the truth is there's probably more Subarus that have this problem just because there's so many built and so many out there. It's right. like a more common car. Right. Subaru also has a lot of exposure, obviously, for Consumer Reports readers because sure. several of them are on our top picks list. I think the Subaru Forester is among the most popular cars researched on our website. So there is tremendous <clears throat> interest. So if there's a 10% problem with these, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of people affected. And you got to start wondering, you know, does what is that? You know, I mean, should that affect our recommendation of this car? Sure. You know, I mean, as everyone knows, I mean, we do recommend a lot of Subarus. Um, there's several top picks that are Subarus. Um, you know, is it a reliability issue? Well, it's not really a reliability issue. It's not like something's broken. We got, you know, these, again, these owner's manuals that say, well, it is normal to put in a quart of oil or mm -hmm. two. Actually, it was BMW cracks this up. BMW sells a little booty for your oil, so you can carry around your oil in your trunk with a little... It's Velcroed <laughs> to the wall of your trunk. <laughs> nice. Right. 
and it's it's some outrageously priced, but it's beautifully made. It probably has, a, it probably has the embroidered BMW logo in the, the Rondale on the of side. Of course, to, cons <laughs> to consistently remind you that, yes, your car is, in fact, burning oil. And that it's in totally normal condition to it's do normal. that. Yeah, you take care of your car and you bring it to you know Gunther down the street and he you know checks but, it out. But speaking of Gunther, I mean some of the numbers on these German cars are are insane. I mean, uh, we we asked we looked at what percentage of cars needed oil added between <coughs> changes. Sixty one percent of two thousand ten Porsche Panameras required adding it, oil between changes, including our Porsche Panamera oh. uh, test car. And it, that it, car it, is, it drank oil like a sailor on leave. I well, mean, it was it was crazy. And, and, and go with this, this, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean, that was an interesting car. So ours actually drank oil too, mm -hmm. the one that we we purchased. And that car is not such an easy one to check the oil because there's actually no dipstick right. on the car. Many of these German cars don't have dipsticks. So and, and then you know if you so if also you're driving along and it says low and there's this whole procedure that you have to do to check the oil because you can't do that. And then if you're you know, at a gas station, you may not have the special zero weight, zero um, synthetic fluid that you, know, you have to put in your Panamera. So it really is a big inconvenience. I mean, that's also becoming a bother because a lot of these cars are calling for synthetic oil. So when you're adding, when you're adding a quart of oil every 750 or 1,000 miles, you know, and this stuff is at least $6 a quart, well, I guess you're buying it at wholesale if you buy a Porsche, you know, or something. You've got so many <laughs> yeah, of them. Just go to Costco. Go to Costco. at the back. I mean, this starts to become annoying and expensive. Well, it's not just that cost, but it's also the longer-term picture of this, which is, while there's no, yet, causal relationship between excessive oil consumption and reliability, one thing that we are seeing from the data is, if a car drinks a little bit of oil when it's new, it's going to drink a lot of oil as it gets older. Mm -hmm. And so that just multiplies your hassle. And eventually, you're going to get sick of this and sell this car, at which time it becomes someone else's problem. Someone who may not actually be familiar with this, mm -hmm. and they'll drive it normally. They'll ignore the check engine light or the check oil light. And suddenly, they'll be in a situation where the engine will be really low on oil. And that could actually damage the engine. Well, sure. let me throw something about it. But conscious, you know, being on a good conscious. So an automaker whether it's Porsche or whatever, on a good conscience of selling you this car, there's a good chance that they, they know in, in that little fine print that ever, and it, it was a Porsche. With Porsche they say, um, as long as it is not using more than one quart every 600 miles, it's within dollars in spec. Who thinks that's normal is just nuts to me. And then if you have this car and you go sell it to someone, and it's using one quart every 800 miles, which is Porsche normal. On a good conscience, could you sell that car to a friend without letting them know that? And if you let them know, no. hey, you have to put a quart every every 100 miles, I don't think they're going to be that interested in buying that car. No. So something else that, that comes up with this is when you see cars burning oil at this rate, it's, it's not just how much they're consuming, but it's also when they consume it. You know, you're, there, there's people who want to just have the vehicle be an appliance. Sure. And so to your point where you were saying, you know, there are other vehicles, there, there are large quantities of, of mass market vehicles. I mean, if you look up Toyota oil consumption or Honda oil consumption, both those automakers are involved in class action lawsuits mm -hmm. for very common engines that also are burning oil. As terms of a percentage of all of them that they make, it's, it's small, but when you look at the, the broad expanse of vehicles that it covers, we're talking millions of cars that are covered by these class right. action lawsuits. Now, what's more important to us is whether or not the manufacturer stands up for its product. So in the case of Honda and Toyota, now they say, oh, it's coincidental, but it just happens to cover <laughs> the exact same vehicles that are mentioned in the lawsuits. Um, those vehicles now have extended powertrain warranties. The trick is now getting, if your car is affected, to get the automaker to, in fact, stand up for it and not say, oh, well, you weren't really maintaining the car, or you drive the vehicle under an excessive use cycle, and therefore it's your fault, you know, Joe consumer, uh, as opposed to, yeah, you know what? Our car shouldn't be burning a quart of oil every right. 600 miles. It's on us to either repair or rebuild the engine. So what does a consumer do? Well, this is, this is the issue right now. Um, there are oil consumption tests that they could get done. So if your car is using amount of, uh, it's using oil, you could actually go to the dealer. And there is, um, you know, unfortunately, it's really up to the manufacturers. If it was it, within the spec that the manufacturers has, you can go and you can negotiate with them. You could ask for, for something, especially if it's under warranty. But right now, because they're really covered by what their specification is, they don't have to do anything for you. Mm -hmm. Generally, um, a lot of manufacturers, and Subaru is one, there's many stories about that, they will take care of the customers out of just 
trying to make their customers happy. Right. Um, but we think they should do more. Right. I want to go back to some of the numbers because I didn't get to finish the numbers of, of cars that the percentage of cars that you need to add oil between changes. I, I believe that Panamera was the worst. Sixty-one percent of 2010 Panameras. Uh, Audis. 58% of 2010 Audi A4s, 55% of Audi Q5s with that two-liter turbo. And there was a class action suit, a lawsuit on those as well. Right. Now, Subaru, Subaru's numbers are, the worst Subaru numbers we've seen are 17% of 2011 Outbacks with the flat six, 13% uh, of 2012 Impreza's, 8% of 2011 Forester's. Now, the current generation cars, like the one parked behind us, uh, there, that Forester, a 2014 Forester, that's running around 2%. So just to put those numbers in perspective. But like you said, Subaru is, Subaru's made changes to the engines. Subaru is trying to repair some engines uh, under warranty to try to help consumers. But that kind of puts the onus back on us. What do we do? What do, you know, people say, how do you recommend these cars? How do you, you know, people who have bought Subarus that are burning oil are unhappy. Right. Well, the question is, what do, what do we do as Consumer Reports do yes. about this? So, I mean, the real question is, you know, we, we do have this data. We're, we're looking at it. We're looking into this. We're monitoring this issue. And what is, you know, I guess, you know, from the audience, you know, what, we're, you know, what is the next step? Mm -hmm. So if, for instance, you know, this guy was, you know, a large percentage in there are burning oil. This Forester here. This Forester here. Um, should we recommend this car anymore? Mm -hmm. um, should that be part of reliability? It really becomes a question. Is that really reliability or is it something else? It's, a, it's an annoyance for sure. Um, but we are looking trying to figure out what the next step is. We're going to continue monitoring this situation. We're do, we've done, doing another survey, trying to get more updated information on which cars are burning oil um, and going back. I mean, certainly putting out the information is something that um, we feel really strongly about mm -hmm. and just letting people know what they're getting into. Because I think the real big gap here and, you know, again, the real service is someone getting into this when they purchase a vehicle and not knowing what's coming. Right. Um, you know, part of me really feels that, you know, if they're going to hide behind and say that quart of oil every thousand miles is normal, you better say that when you, sign, some, you make somebody sign on the bottom line. Mm. Well, and something that I think is, is uh, <coughs> duplicitous is too strong a word, but something where they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. These automakers are saying, you can go 7,500 miles, you can go 10,000 miles between an oil change, oil and filter change, but in reality, <laughs> if you're changing a quart of oil every 600 miles, the oil is going to be pretty much new when you go in for your 10,000 mile yeah. service. Well, unless you're burning off the, the clean part <laughs> and keeping the sludge, who knows? But, I mean, but, but the question is, you know, and you bring up a really important point there, is that we are seeing longer and longer oil service lengths. But as they extend that oil change interval, as they go to these really low viscosity oils, which get better fuel efficiency and perhaps better performance, it seems to be exacerbating this issue. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, maybe 10 years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of new cars that were consuming oil. Now it's getting worse. And actually one thing that Subaru did was they're actually um, compressing that oil change interval and making yeah, it more frequently. It, yeah. You know, and I'm not, you know, they're not really clear what the reason is, but perhaps if you do that, there's less of a chance that you're gonna have to be adding oil. Yeah. So we want to know what you think about this issue because it's a very complex issue. So what we recommend you do is go to consumerreports.org, uh, go to our blog, uh, see the blog about the, this episode of Talking Cars, and let us know. Put something in the comments. We'd love to hear what you have to say. You can also leave reader comments on YouTube, and we have a whole bunch of comments on our last episode talking about sports sedans. The last show, someone asked us, if, what sports sedan would you recommend? And none of them are easy because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of cars don't drive well. The Lexus IS, the Infiniti Q50, right. they kind of let us down. BMW has iffy reliability. Um, so plenty of people offered suggestions as to what sports sedan people should buy. Uh, one comment says, surprised that with all the Volvo talk on last episode, the S60 was not offered up as an option. It's not new or exciting, but very nice premium. It has great safety ratings. Also, for the price of all those, you could go get a nice Dodge Charger. Yes, it's much bigger and won't handle as well. It's available with everything you need and is a fun car to drive in a different way. How's the S60 as a sports sedan? The S60 is a great lease 
uh, vehicle because they can't give them away, and so they are making them <laughs> very available for lease prices that would normally be more equivalent to that of a Honda Accord. So when you're in the S60, yes, it's a luxury car. The leather seats are fantastic, but as a driving experience, when you put it up against something like the BMW 3 Series, it falls short. It's a half step down. It's, it's a satisfying car, but it's, it's half a step down. If, if you're fine driving a satisfactory vehicle, if you get out of the car and say, well, that was satisfactory, perfect. Uh, I'd say nice. I'd say nice more than satisfactory. I would say it's a luxury sedan. I don't know how the sport part, you know, and I think sport, um, they can rear wheel drive and agile handling, stuff like that. Are you and thinking Dodge Charger? That is a very sporty vehicle. Actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. A Dodge Charger is a very nice, luxurious vehicle in some ways, too, depending on what equipment you get. But yeah, it's not a tight, small, nimble vehicle. No, I think part of this is that the original question in the last episode was, Lexus IS, Infiniti Q50, it was that sort of shrunken yeah, size, sure. that, that compactness. Um, but talking about Infinities, uh, Bo Gumoto asks, if the Infiniti G37 was the highest rated sport compact electric sedan until 2013, playing a, going through the archives of our ratings, mm -hmm. why isn't the Q40 even mentioned as an option to the field of newer but imperfect crop of sports sedans? Sure, it's a bit dated, certainly doesn't have the all new aura of the newer offerings. You could probably buy a new Q50 with all the option package, all two of them, for less than an equivalently equipped two year old 328i. I have a feeling the Q40 is a much better long term proposition. Now the Q40 is a renamed uh, G37. G37. Which is thank a... you, thank you, Infinity. Yep. What do we think of the Q40, Jake? Uh, it was. He's got. He's got a very good point. I mean, the the Q. You know, again, the G37. We liked it when we tested it, like 300 years ago. I, I mean, here's <laughs> the here's, long time here's the strange thing. It, it's an old car at this point. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know. Certainly has a lot of things going for it. And you put that time machine back when the thing came out new, and it was it was terrific. Um, but right now, when you buy a brand new car, there's so much new technology that you're getting. There's there's newer, you know, whether it's the, from a safety standpoint or an infotainment standpoint, and all these things that you expect. I mean, what that car has still a compact flash drive in it, I think, you know, sure, and a yeah. Yeah, you set player it to or something. Yeah, you compare to a Mercedes C-Class. There's, I mean, the the difference in the technology levels is astonishing. Yeah, so. you compare it to anything in the class. I mean, there's no. There's no forward collision warning. There's no, I mean, the thing is with the Q40 is that they've basically, they've sucked down the model lineup to this point where the car is just hanging on on life support. I mean, it's kind of this afterthought at this point. Uh, it's not gonna have the same crash protection because I mean, it's the design came out in 07, so it was designed in 05 probably. So right, it's, right, right. that's pretty old. You don't have the modern safety gear. You don't have the modern infotainment. Yes, it's fun to drive and it's reliable and it's probably $35,000. Retail, right? So, by that way, it's tempting. But as a satisfac well, satisfying modern sports sedan, uh, and the I truth is, know. if you're looking for an older car, could have used one. Yeah, you know, there's not a whole lot of difference there's, there's there. There's very little difference there. Uh, Steve asks, "How about the Hyundai Genesis for a sports sedan?" The Hyundai Genesis is not a sports sedan. <laughs> Done. It's a, it's done. done. <laughs> it's, 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 All right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a good sedan, and the infotainment uh, package that comes with it is it's really terrific. good. Yeah. And the you feel, if if you take the badging off, you would have a hard time convincing anybody that it was a Hyundai. Uh, but in terms of is it a sports sedan, that's a really tough equation to figure out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's a good bargain Audi A6, is what it is. It's a nice car, not a sports sedan. We're talking about small, tight, nimble, not so much. Uh, moving on, uh, for the sports car guy, just get a loaded Mazda 6 Grand Touring or a mid-range Audi A6 if you want more luxury. The Mazda 6 isn't a bad choice, but again, it's half a size bigger and it doesn't quite have the interior luxury. Enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> enjoy the savings, I mean, just go get the Mazda 6. Look, so. we want to go cross out of the, you know, like, yeah, go get a Mazda 3 for, for all, you know. And we'll get to that actually soon. <laughs> Did someone else? Yeah, we're there soon. Uh, the Audi A6, someone else said that on Twitter, just, just, you know, skip the whole class, go to an Audi A6. An A6 is a lot more car. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just drove a 2016 Audi A6 with the four-cylinder, uh, that yeah, two-liter four-cylinder. Um, it's a lovely car. Mm -hmm. Very nice car. It's well, not a, the sticker price on fifty five thousand dollars, which is fifteen thousand more than where I think you want to be in this this field. Uh, get into the Mazda three. Uh, 
Oh, good times. Yeah, it's Felix Wong says, I am struggling to decide between a 2011 BMW 328xi um, certified pre-owned and a brand new Mazda 3 hatchback. The BMW is listed about 17,000 bucks. I value a lot about driving experience and interior quality. I'd love to find a car at corners well, quiet inside, and a heck of a lot of fun to drive. Will the four years difference in the Mazda badge justify the extra $8,000? And what's your opinion on the GTI for my case? Yeah, I'm waiting for the GTI. <laughs> the GTI has got a sweet spot between the two vehicles, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's more money, actually, than the Mazda 3, even. But so well, they, don't, they don't make a Speed 3 anymore? No. So. Yeah. Okay, so. Well, what do you think? Use BMW or new <laughs> Mazda 3? Well, as, as the owner of a 2012 BMW 3, um, it's, it's a fantastic car. Its driving experience is probably the best in that segment. But there are things about that vehicle that are just so irritating. The stop-start system is probably the worst in the industry. Every time you come to a, a stop, yeah, you can turn it off every time you start the car. Yeah, they've improved it in later years, but you got the first year. Yeah, Congratulations. It, yeah, <laughs> it feels like you're sitting on the airplane, there's that little kid behind you kicking, kicking, <laughs> kicking. That is what this car does. The infotainment system, the, the nav system is intolerable. So there's all these little things that make you have the buying experience, the ownership experience that's, that's not as great. On the flip side, Mazda 3 is a fantastic car for what it is. It's a, not budget priced, but it's, it's a lesser priced vehicle. And you'll notice that when you're out on the road, more road noise comes in, more tire noise, more wind noise. You know, the, the things where you spend that extra $20,000 for the BMW, all those things aren't part of the Mazda experience. That said, I'm still waiting for my check from Mazda for all the people I've referred into Mazda 3s. <laughs> They've all bought them. They've all loved them. So I think a lot of people watching this podcast and us having talked about Mazdas in probably seven out of the eight last yeah. shows are, are waiting I, for I, us to get our checks. Wait, what you're missing with the Mazda is the, the luxuriousness and the quietness, you know, that you're going to get with that BMW. And, and there's sort of one other thing to confuse him even more, a Golf 1.8. Mm. You know, I mean, this is a car that's, that's not going to be super expensive. Nice and it's going to give you a nice driving enjoyment. And you're going to have a brand new car with a warranty. Or but the GTI. Yeah, for, for a couple grand more. Right. But the Mazda is going to be probably the most reliable of this whole. Certainly. Bunch, so, yes. So that counts for <clears> something. <throat> Last question. My mom is considering the 2016 Range Rover Evoque, the redesigned 2016 Mercedes GLC. God, I hate their new names. And the Tesla Model S. Reliability issues with the Range Rover and Mercedes are drawbacks for her because she'll keep this car about eight years. But the initial investment of the Tesla is also hard for her to swallow. How many years would it take until the repairs and maintenance costs of the Range Rover and Mercedes catch up to the investment of the Tesla? What would you recommend? Well, I don't think you would have to buy two Evokes to equal the cost of a Tesla. So I'm surprised that need they would be evokes. considering <laughs> the Mazda GLC. Um, I, no, I just no, that's, that's, that's oh, the Mercedes, Mercedes GLC. Mercedes GLC. Right. It's not the great little car from oh, 1980. Okay. Yeah, that's totally different. Um, the Evoke's yeah. a lousy car. Let me just say that. Let yeah, let's, just let's, let's take that let, out. Let's just let's just nip that problem. So basically, right if it's now. a Vogue or what's behind door number two? Door number two. Yeah, that GLC Mirage. looks good. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, the the Land Rover <clears throat> Rain, the Land Rover Range Rover Evoque is a great looking SUV that is a great looking SUV, and that's about the end of it. Yeah, it's a great it's a great car until you get into it. Yeah. Right, it's much better from the outside. It is it is the perfect valet parking car. You roll up, it makes this statement. You're like, wow, that's a really cool car. And then you unfold yourself out of it. And that's if you're in the front seat. If yeah. you're in the back, you're, well. You probably weren't in the back. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that, that Land Rover, it, it looks good, but it, it's, it's really an unrewarding car to drive. The Discovery Sport is just a slightly more practical version of it, but still invokes much of the, evokes much of the same misery. The Tesla <laughs> is a lovely car. I mean, you know, it, it's our top rated car. It's, but it's, a basically a hundred thousand dollar car in that and it's an electric car so you need to understand you need to are you going to make that investment are you going to make that lifestyle change I mean, and and are you near the infrastructure that will support it do you live near a supercharger are you willing to turn your house into a charging station these are all other questions as well yeah i mean mom has to decide if she's willing to go through all of that if yeah. the grandkids don't live within the radius of supercharging stations mom's going to need a tow truck because she's going to run out of charge going to some remote part of north dakota to to visit the grandkids well we just need to know a lot more questions how close is she with the kids does she want to see the kids you know i mean it, it's one of these <laughs> things where we can't really <laughs> answer these questions you know i mean you're right you're right without visiting them basically. right we have to understand the the relationship that they have yeah 
The thing is, there's also lots of nice luxury cars between the Land Rover Evoque and the Tesla Model S. I mean, that Mercedes GLC will probably be a very nice car. There's the Audi A6, there's the Hyundai Genesis we talked about earlier. There's a, there's a ton of choices here. So that's going to wrap it up for this episode of Talking Cars. As always, we thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.